Hi there, it's Pastor Dave. back with another midweek message. want to be an encouragement and a blessing to you this week. We've been studying the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter number 5. I hope you'll open up your Bible and follow along with us here today as we study these Beatitudes, the blessings of God. And, uh, and oftentimes we are blessed when we do not think we are blessed. Let me remind you before we read our text here today that these are spiritual blessings that we are reading about. I know many of these things, they appear to be physical things and, and emotional things, but the application is spiritual with each of these. We certainly see that as we see the first several roll together to bring us to the point of salvation and what a blessing that is. And so let's look at our text. We'll go back and we'll review the first several. Just real quickly look at those. But in Matthew chapter number five, beginning in verse number Number one, the Bible tells us, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And here we have this list of blessings that we have. And, and remember there is uh, each of these things that we have described for us here. They are blessings in and of themselves. And I believe there's additional blessings along with it. But if you are poor in spirit, you're blessed. And remember, this application is a spiritual application. We're not talking about educational poverty. We're not talking about financial poverty. We're talking about spiritual poverty. When we recognize our need, our emptiness, that we are spiritually poor, there is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are poor spiritually. When we recognize that, that's a blessing. That's a good thing. And uh, blessed are they that mourn. Uh, and, and the idea of mourning here uh, is certainly we think about it. We think about physical death. But folks, all physical death is a result of sin. People die because sin came into the world and death came because of sin. And so when we mourn physical death, we're mourning something spiritual as well. And, uh, and the spiritual application for us here is the idea that if, that if we recognize our sin, how poor we are spiritually, then that should bring mourning and sadness and sorrow to our lives. And, uh, and so we're blessed when we recognize, when we're sorrowful over the fact that we are sinners. Uh, blessed are the meek. And we realize we cannot save ourselves. Our own righteousness is not sufficient. We are not righteous in and of ourselves. There is this humbleness. There is this reliance upon God in this meekness here. Uh, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And here we come to it because we recognize we're poor, because we mourn our spiritual poverty, uh, because we are meek and we humble ourselves. Then here's the idea that now we are hungering and thirsting for righteousness that we cannot get ourselves. And there's this wonderful promise, if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we shall be filled. God will find us, God will fill us. If we're looking for that spiritual filling, God promises to fill us. And what a wonderful promise and a wonderful blessing that is. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, is the next one. And uh, when we've received God's mercy, then we can be merciful in a spiritual way, in a godly way. And we can share the mercy of God. And then there's this idea that it'll be reciprocated to us. Others will be merciful to us as well. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And when we are saved and born again, in, and, uh, and we have the pureness that only Christ can give us. We can recognize God in his word. We can recognize God in the world around us. We can recognize God working in our hearts. And one day, of course, there's that, that uh, wonderful opportunity. We'll get to see Christ face to face. We'll get to be in God's presence, be able to worship him in heaven. And, uh, and so blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, last time we looked at how the peacemakers are blessed, for they shall be called the children of God. 
And now we're talking about doing something active, actively looking uh, to to share the peace of God and 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 not just physical peace, not just ending world wars or or battles or conflicts, even amongst uh, maybe those that are close to us. It's not just ending those conflicts. It's ending the spiritual conflicts, bringing peace, spiritual peace, God's peace into this world around us. And when we share God's peace with others, uh, we'll be called the children of God. Our desire to see other people get saved and have a relationship with God when they were at one time enemies with God, people recognize us and call us the children of God. I want people to know that I'm a child of the King. I want people to know that I'm saved. I want people to identify that and recognize that in me. And I hope you do as well. And then we have the one that we're coming to today. It's the last one we're going to look at. And really it encompasses not just one verse, but really the last several verses. But the Bible says in verse number 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those which are persecuted. And here's one of those things you say, boy, that's not a blessing. You say, that's not good. I don't want that in my life. That's a problem. That's pain. That's difficulty. But God says you're blessed. Persecution is a blessing. Not just there's going to be blessings as a result, but persecution itself is a blessing. We need to be reminded that the kingdom of heaven here is not the only blessing you get. Being persecuted itself is a blessing and brings a blessing to our lives. The Bible says in Philippians 1.29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. It is something that is given. It's a gift that's given to us to suffer for Christ's sake. And so let's look at a few thoughts on this here today. We'll start with this idea of, of why. Why will we be persecuted? And the Bible tells us here in verse number 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, being righteous in our hearts, reflected in our actions. That This is a, a righteousness that comes from Christ. Remember, it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. But the fact that we are righteous, because of what God has done for us, because of the gift we've accepted of Him, because of this righteousness of God, we're going to be persecuted. Christ's righteousness in our lives, think about this, it, it, it condemns others. It helps others recognize their own sin and their own spiritual poverty. It helps people recognize, and you think about that, when we see that we are spiritually poor, what does that do? Hopefully, it instills in us this mourning and this sadness, and hopefully, it leads us to this hunger and thirsting for righteousness. Hopefully, that's what this does. But for some people, they see their own spiritual poverty, and they see somebody else is righteous because of what God has done. It might bring anger and frustration and jealousy. And when you point out, even through our actions, that somebody else's actions are sinful and wrong. It brings that harsh judgment, that criticism, and even that persecution. So for righteousness sake, but not just righteousness sake, because the Bible goes on. Look, look, look at verse number 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute, persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So understand this, we're persecuted for righteousness sake but Jesus says you're persecuted for my sake for Christ's sake it is our relationship with and our service for Christ the fact that we draw near to Christ it's going to lead to persecution and many Christians um, and many Christian attributes are looked upon favorably think about that certainly people are don't don't look negatively on Christians that are helpful and loving and kind those are attributes that they want to see but I'll tell you something folks Christians that are quiet in their faith are accepted, but those that act out their faith, those that believe God's word, those that would act on it. We've seen some of that here with the organization Samaritan's Purse uh, trying to help out during this coronavirus epidemic. And here they are. They are loving. They are kind. They're trying to bring health and healing to those that are sick. And we find they are condemned because they believe God's word, because they believe what Christ had to say. And so you find there that maybe if they were quiet about their faith in God's word and just acted in their benevolence in trying to bring healing, you know what, the healing part is okay, but don't bring me God's word. Then the persecution comes. That's what we see in this world, in this society. There is there's persecution. When we try to take a stand for Christ, when we try to live for Him, there's going to be persecution. When we try to live a righteous life, the Bible tells in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
Understand, it's not being a Christian that brings persecution or being saved that brings persecution, but it's living a Christian life. It's trying to live godly. It's trying to live separate from this world. That's why so many Christians don't. That's why it's so easy for us as Christians not to live separate, to live like the world. Because there's no persecution then. But if we live godly in this world, you will suffer persecution. If you try to live a life like Christ lived, there will be persecution. And so being saved doesn't bring persecution, but living a Christian life, living a godly life will. That's who's persecuted. And how will we be persecuted? Verse number 11 gives us that list. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And so this idea of reviling, this is a verbal attack. People speaking out against us, persecuting you. In the Greek word, it means to pursue. They're, they're, they're pursuing and chasing you. They're harassing you. They are troubling you, molesting you, is the idea that this, this Greek word encompasses here. Saul hunted down the church uh, there, we read in the book of Acts, before he was saved. And, and that was that persecution, that harassment, that hunting down of, of, uh, of the believers. And, uh, and that's the, the persecution there. And then you find that third idea where it says uh, to speak or shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. How frustrating that people bring false accusations. And you find that a lot today. Christians that stand up for a biblical idea of marriage, that maybe stand up against sin, what the world calls okay today. If you take a stand today against homosexuality, against the homosexual lifestyle, you know what people say? People say that you are full of hate and you're speaking hate and you're promoting violence and hatred and, and, uh, and, and, and homophobia and the use all these and these are none of these things are true for the vast majority of Christians that stand against homosexuality we love the people that have fallen in sin we care about them because God cares about them we love them because God loves them we want to see their lives become better we want to see their lives uh, change for the best we want to see them begin to have a relationship with Jesus Christ that's what we want that's what we desire it's not out of hatred or anger or bitterness or fear and yet people will revile and say things against us falsely because we believe God's word. And, and, and it'll happen to us if we take a stand for God's word, if we take a stand for what's true. And I'll tell you something, folks, it's not a bad thing. And, and look at that. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner against you, of evil against you falsely for my sake. It is a blessing for that to happen. Look at what... Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19-24, through 24, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. You know, he says, it's thankworthy if a man for conscience towards God, because you're trying to do what God wants you to do, if you endure grief and suffer wrongfully. Be thankful. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? You know, there's no glory in being punished for what you did wrong. That's just and right. There's no glory in being punished for when you did the wrong thing. But if when you do well and suffer for it, he says, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. If you do what's right and you suffer for it, God says that is acceptable. And he gives us this wonderful example. What kind of example do we have of somebody doing what's right, doing well, and then suffering? For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Here's the wonderful example that we have. It is Jesus Christ who suffered for doing well, for doing what was right. And he came and preached a gospel of peace. He preached the gospel of salvation. And he was persecuted and hated and spoken evil against falsely and reviled. And yet he endured it patiently. Today he sits at the right hand of the throne of God on our behalf, lifted up and exalted. Why is that? First of all, because he endured for doing well. He did well and endured the grief and suffering that came with it. That promise is for us as well. Can I tell you something? We need to be willing to endure persecution and grief and difficulty. 
You know, you look at our society today, you look at America today, you say, there's not much persecution. But I'll tell you something, it's coming, and there's more of it maybe than what you think. Just this past weekend in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, the rioters and looters were out. Of course, there's a lot of that going on right now. Uh, a lot of peaceful protests, but along with that, a lot of people taking advantage with their own ideologies as well as their own, their own lust and their own greed and their own desire for anarchy and destruction. And so that happened in Madison, Wisconsin this weekend. The rioters and looters came out. They damaged, destroyed, looted over 70 businesses. And it's interesting, somewhere in the chain of command, either at the mayor's office or with the police chief or somewhere along the line, they decided they were not going to persecute, they were not going to prosecute or arrest any of the rioters or looters. They were not going to arrest any of them. They let them basically run free to do what damage they wanted to do. While at the same time this weekend, threats were made against churches. If churches were to assemble and worship peacefully and worship God and come together and pray, they'd be fined a thousand dollar fine. Can you imagine? Rioters and looters are free to do what they want to do, but Christians who pray and worship are arrested or fined for serving and worshiping God. How things have gotten backwards in this world so quickly is amazing to me. And I know there's safety concerns with the coronavirus, but I'll tell you what, what hypocrisy. They're not worried about coronavirus for the rioters or looters. They're not worried about the business owners who are losing their, their income and their, their property. But they're worried about Christians that pray. They're worried about Christians that worship together. How sad that is. Can I tell you something, folks? It's a sign of the times. It's a sign of the world in which we live. But there are blessings for being persecuted for righteousness sake. So how should we react? When we see what's going on in Madison, Wisconsin, we saw what happened uh, to, uh, to, to, to these other or Christian organizations that try to not only speak up for Christ and His Word, but try to live a godly example, and they're persecuted and lied about. And if that happens to us, how should we react? Well, the Bible tells us a couple things. First of all, remember this, you're blessed. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Remember that you're blessed. Remember how good God is. Remember, remember that we are blessed with persecution here. Understand what persecution is. We're privileged to share the sufferings of Christ. We saw what Peter had to say. And you know, we're, we're the, Christ is our example. We get to do something that Christ did. We get to be like Christ. We get to share in his persecution. In Philippians uh, chapter 3 and verse number 10, Paul speaks about his great desire. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Paul says, boy, it's my greatest desire to know Christ, not just the, the glory of his resurrection, but also his suffering. From the best of the best to the worst of the worst, he says, I want to know him. We're blessed to be able to know Christ and to be, exper to be able to experience what he's experienced. And, and tribulations, remember this, they bring additional blessings. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, uh, and not only so, but, uh, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Look at the blessings. And he goes on to list this. It starts with tribulation. When we endure tribulation, guess what? We gain patience. And as we gain patience, we gain experience and then hope. And then hope makes not to be ashamed. So you find the blessings that are compounded because it starts with tribulation. There are blessings that come from tribulation, from difficulties. And so remember that we're blessed and rejoice and be exceeding glad. Rejoice. That's what he says in verse number 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Rejoice and celebrate Celebrate what? The fact that somebody sees Christ in you. That's a great thing to celebrate. I want people to be able to know that I'm a Christian, to be able to see that I'm a Christian. People to be able to identify Christ in me. That's a great thing. 
And we ought to rejoice in that. And, uh, and, and these afflictions that we experience are for Christ's sake. Jesus said in John 15, he says, If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted you, they will also pers- if they have persecuted me, Jesus said, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So, but all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Jesus says, listen, they've persecuted me. They're going to persecute you. That's a blessing. We're, our afflictions are for Christ's sake, and, and God gets the glory. And it's effective in other people seeing even our suffering. When we stand up for God, it can be effective in sharing the truth of God's word. Trials bring us into fellowship with the godly martyrs as well. You think about those that have gone on before us, those that have served God, those that have even suffered. It brings us into sweet fellowship with those. The prophets suffered before us, it said there in verse number 12. It says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Can I tell you something? I don't think I'll ever be a David. I'll never be a, a Saul. I'll never Solomon. Um, I'll never be a, a Samuel. I'll never be a, a Paul. I'll never be one of these godly prophets that went before, one of these godly servants of God that went before. I'll, I'll never be able to obtain uh, what they have and what they are. But I'll tell you something. God says this, this suffering will put us all in the same company, the same fellowship. And, and when we get a we get a fellowship, boy, you read chapter Hebrews chapter eleven verses thirty two through thirty eight. Here you read about these heroes of the faith, and we read about Gideon and Barak and David and Samuel and Jephthah and Samson and all the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms and wrought righteousness and obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. They waxed valiant in fight. They turned to flight the armies of aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Here's the affliction of the prophets that went before us. But I'll tell you something wonderful about them. They served faithfully in spite of the persecution. And this puts us in the same company. When we endure persecution, when we endure revilings, when we endure false witnesses, it puts us in the same company. And the Bible says, great is our reward in heaven. There's a reward in heaven. Remember the blessings. Remember the the opportunities. Rejoice in this opportunity. That there is this gift, that there is rejoicing in heaven, there's rewards in heaven. When we endure things here, listen, nobody likes the thought of persecution. Nobody wants to endure persecution. And being glad through persecution seems to be difficult. We have some wonderful examples biblically, though, of men that rejoiced in the midst of their persecution. The early apostles after Jesus Christ ascended up into heaven. They rejoiced when they were beaten for Christ's sake, they rejoiced when they were they they were they were um, persecuted for Christ's sake. The Bible says in Acts five forty one, speaking of Peter and John, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. They thought, boy, this is, we're counted worthy. We're identified as Christians. We're counted worthy to suffer shame. Jesus suffered shame. We suffer shame for Him. They were rejoiced that they were counted worthy. That Paul and Silas, you remember them in the Philippian jailer. In the Philippian jail, I'm sorry. They sang and they prayed there in that jail. And others heard them. Can I tell you something? We can rejoice. We need to rejoice in the midst of persecution, in the midst of reviling, even when people say false things against us. We need to rejoice. And so let's pray. Let's pray for three things. Let's pray for the courage to be the Christians God has called us to be, even though we may not be looked favorably upon in this world. Let's pray for that courage. Let's pray for the strength to endure the persecution and not to give in to the world's desires or to capitulate to the world's demands. Let's pray for strength to endure the persecution. And let's pray for fruit to be one. We find those wonderful examples with Peter and John. We find that with Paul and Silas. Souls were saved. Lives were changed because why? They rejoiced in the midst of their persecution. 
Let's pray that there will be fruit in the midst of persecution. Let's pray for courage. Let's pray for strength. Let's pray for fruit. Let's pray that we'd be what God has called us to be. Join me here as we pray right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for the wonderful opportunity that we have, dear Lord, to live for you, to be an example for you. Help us, dear Lord, with great courage to, to live out your word, to obey your commands to us, to be what you've called us to be. And Heavenly Father, give us great courage, dear Lord, to take a stand on your word, even though it may bring persecution in our lives. And dear Lord, I just pray that as persecution comes, we'd be strong and faithful. We'd endure it cheerfully and joyfully with rejoicing, dear Lord. And I just pray to Heavenly Father, we'd see fruit as a result. We'd see souls saved and lives changed because Christians take a stand for what's right. We take a stand for what's best. And I pray that you'd be magnified and glorified. I too pray that you'd do a great work, that souls would be saved, that lives would be changed. And Lord, I just pray that this video would have a great impact in hearts and lives for you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Goodbye.